Allah is not another name for God. Buddha is not God. The Bible says there is one God. We get this idea, well, these people are just sincere followers of the truth. They're just trying to find God in their way. It's harmless, these other religions. No, these religions, every one of them, is demonically inspired. Welcome to Pathway to Victory with Dr. Robert Jeffress. And thank you for tuning into the program today. I'm amazed how many people drive while looking at their phones these days. The warnings are out there, even laws are in place, and still I can count the number of people while I'm driving that are glued to their phones. We also know that this distraction really can lead to some very serious results. Well, you know, the truth is there are a lot more things that get us distracted when it comes to following God. We may be driving down redeemed road, but we're glued to so many other things, and rather than paying attention to the road God's laid out for us. Today, Dr. Jeffress is going to help us know how to stay on course. It's part two of Ties That Bind. You know, one of the best examples of what it means to flee from sin rather than use our freedom to run towards sin is the Old Testament story of Joseph. Remember Genesis chapter 39? Joseph had been made by the providence of God, the steward over Potiphar's household. Potiphar was in charge of the military under Pharaoh, and he had put Joseph in charge, being the steward over all of his domestic affairs. And remember, Mrs. Potiphar had a thing for Joseph. She was always coming on to him, trying to get him involved in sexual immorality. And at one point, he said, no, how could I do this great thing and sin against God? Just because you say no to temptation once, don't think you'll never experience it again. Because the next verse says, day after day, she came to Joseph. And one day, remember, she was alone with him in the house, and she grabbed him by the shoulder, and she said, lie with me. What did Joseph do? He didn't linger at all. In fact, the Bible says he ran so quickly in the other direction that Mrs. Potiphar was left holding a piece of his garment in her hand. See, Joseph understood that his freedom might allow him to stay there. Oh, he could stay there if he wanted to, but he was too wise for that. He knew that his freedom should be used not to pursue sin, but to pursue righteousness. That's what a wise person does, and that's exactly what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. He said, flee from tempting situations. Flee from idolatry. You cannot mix the worship of Christ and the worship of idols. He illustrates that truth in two very specific ways. First of all, by the Lord's table. He says the Lord's table illustrates how you can't mix idolatry and Christianity. How does that work? Look at verses 15 to 17. He says, I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Let me explain what he's saying here. He's saying when we worship together at the Lord's table, we're not just worshiping any and every God. We're worshiping one God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said when we come to the Lord's table, we're not just worshiping any God. We're worshiping the one God who manifested Himself in Jesus Christ. We are remembering His body, His blood that was shed for us. You can't mix idolatry with true faith in Christ. He said, here's another example of the Israelite feast in verse 18. Look at the nation Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar? When these Israelites shared in the feast, they were not participating in sacrifices and feasts to Moloch or to Baal or to Asherah. They were worshiping a specific God, the only true God. You cannot mix idolatry and Christianity. Now, Paul is saying that Participating in idol feast is the very same thing as worshiping an idol. And so the Corinthians wonder, well, Paul, how is that? If there is no such thing as an idol, what does it matter if we go up to the temple of Venus and participate in this idol worship? If idols aren't real, what difference does it make? Paul answers that question by, first of all, telling us the truth about idols. Look at verse 19. What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? He's saying, is there anything real about an idol? Of course not. There's nothing real about an idol. Jot down Psalm 115, verses 4 to 8, that demonstrates how impotent that idols really are. Look at Psalm 115, verses 4 to 8. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. 
They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them. The truth about idols, there's nothing real about them at all. But don't miss this second thing Paul says in verses 20 and 22. He's going to tell us the truth about demons. Look at verse 20. No, but I saw that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. Demons are fallen angels that Satan uses to accomplish his purpose. And what Paul is saying is there is nothing real about idols. But behind every idol... Behind every false religion is a demonic presence, a demonic power. And there is something very, very real about demons. In fact, demons can actually take, now get this, they can take lifeless, inanimate objects like idols and give them supernatural powers. Did you know that? Satan, demons have the power to give inanimate objects the ability to perform supernatural works. Think about Pharaoh's magicians, for example. They had the ability to work magic. One reason we shouldn't get swept away by miracles is Satan has the ability to perform miracles as well. We ought to test every experience, every truth, by not whether or not it's miraculous, but whether it aligns with the Word of God. That is the test by whether something is of God or of Satan. But the fact is, Satan has the ability to perform miracles. Now, if you find that difficult to believe, turn over in your Bible, hold your place here, and turn over to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. In the final years of Earth's history, the tribulation, the false prophet, remember he is Antichrist lieutenant, is going to be given power to give life to a lifeless representation of the Antichrist. Look at Revelation 13, verses 13 to 15. Talking about the false prophet, John says, He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He'll have the ability to call down fire from heaven. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image, an idol of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him, that is the false prophet, to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. You say, why would God allow a false prophet to have such miraculous power in order to deceive people? The New Testament says over and over again, when you reject the truth of God, God will send a deluding lie to you so that you cannot believe the truth. That is the punishment for rejecting the truth of God. That's what's going to happen in the final day. Demons will use lifeless idols to deceive people. So we shouldn't be surprised that demons use something as seemingly harmless as an idol, as a false religion, to accomplish their purpose. Listen to Psalm 106, verses 34 to 37. They do not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and they learned their practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. Now, when the Israelites and the Canaanites sacrificed children, did they think they were sacrificing them to demons? Of course not. They thought they were sacrificing them to gods, to deities. But they weren't. Behind those false religions were demons that were being used to deceive people. You know, we get this idea in our inclusive culture that, well, you know, everybody, regardless of their religion, they're following after the same God, and they just call him different names, but it's all the same God. No, it's not. Allah is not God. Allah is not another name for God. Buddha is not God. The Bible says there is one God. We get this idea, well, these people are just sincere followers of the truth. They're just trying to find God in their way. It's harmless, these other religions. No, these religions, every one of them, is demonically inspired to lead people away from the true God. I cannot believe the churches I'm reading about right now, they're actually renting out their church facilities 
to the Muslims, to the Buddhists, to the Seventh-day Adventists, to other groups, renting out their churches to meet in as if they are some harmless group coming into their church. When you rent out your church and invite other religions to come in, you're opening your church up to demons. That's all that is. Every other religion is demonically inspired. That's what the Bible says. Look at verses 21 to 22. For you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? There is a very real spiritual force going on between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And it's important that we understand you cannot mix truth and error. Rob Bell says that eventually everyone is going to be saved. Eventually, everybody's going to be rescued from unbelief. It doesn't really matter what different religions you're following. You can see Christ in all different religions. It's the same Christ. That is a doctrine from the pit of hell. Rob Bell's a heretic. He's a charlatan. All he's trying to do is sell books. And it's time that this fraud be exposed. You say, well, Pastor, why do you get so hot and bothered about something like that? It bothers me when somebody who claims to be a Christian, an evangelical pastor, in order to sell books, is willing to condemn people to the very hell he denies exist. And I think it's time to speak up against that. I think it's time to say we don't believe that. That is an error. It is a falsehood. You cannot mix truth and error. That's what Paul is saying here. Well, you're thinking, finally a message that doesn't apply to me. Because after all, I'm not into idol worship. This doesn't apply to me. Well, don't be so sure. Don't forget what the theme of this passage is. The theme is we need to guard against using our freedom in Christ to lure us away from God. See, the fact is freedoms, whatever they are in Christ, can quickly become idols that Satan can use to lure us away from God. The Corinthians were using their freedom to move them not away from sin, but as close to the edge of sin as possible. And they were falling into sin. You're listening to Pathway to Victory with Dr. Robert Jeffress. And we'll get back to the program in just a minute. If I were to ask you if you knew what the purpose in your life was, could you answer that question with confidence? The thing is, most people don't have a clue to what their purpose is. Well, I've got some great news for you. Dr. Jeffress has just come out with a brand new book called The Power of a Positive Purpose. It'll give you the tools and the expert clarity and how you can discover and begin to move in the unique purpose God has made you for. Get this powerful new book by Dr. Jeffress along with the complimenting audio CD titled You and Your Spiritual Gift. Both of these invaluable resources are yours for your very generous gift to Pathway to Victory this month. It's so important to us that we make available to you each month resources that will motivate you and encourage you and help you grow in your journey with God. That's why we've taken things a step further. So this month for your gift of $60 or more, we're sending you the brand new hardcover book by Dr. Jeffers called The Power of a Positive Purpose, along with the entire 12 CD audio set of the series we're in called 10 Crucial Questions for You and Your Church. So get a hold of us today by calling 1-866-999-2965 or go online to ptv.org. You can also connect with us through the mail at P.O. Box 223-609, Dallas, Texas, 75222. I'll have all that for you a bit later, but for right now, let's get back to Dr. Jeffress with the rest of today's program. I was thinking this week, what are some freedoms that we have as Christians that, if we're not careful, can easily become idols to us that lead us away from God? I was thinking of three this week. You know, I got the old tennis racket out here. First idol I would think about that would apply to us would be recreation. You know, I used to play tennis in high school and some in college. You know, if I wanted to, and I weren't the pastor, I could be out playing tennis right now. That is a freedom I have in Christ. And yet there are many Christians who allow their love for recreation to suddenly become an idol in their life and to take them further and further and further away from God. I was reading this week in Eugene Peterson's new autobiography. He was telling a story about a man in his church in Maryland, and the man was a faithful church attender, and he and his wife came every week. And one Sunday, Peterson noticed they weren't there for services. Then the next Sunday they weren't there. The next Sunday they weren't there. So he went to visit them. And he said, I've noticed you've been out of church now almost two months. What's going on? The man said, well, pastor, I'm just going to level with you. 
So about two months ago, one Sunday morning, we got up and it was such a beautiful day. And I said, honey, instead of going to church, why don't we go fishing? So we went out to the lake and we fished. And he said, you know what happened? Lightning didn't strike us dead when we missed church and we went fishing. And we thought this was a pretty enjoyable experience. So why don't we go next week? And so we went the next week and then the next week and then the next week. That freedom they had in Christ suddenly became an idol to them and led them not toward God, but away from God. That's what freedom will do for you if you're not careful. You know, another freedom that people have is in the area of entertainment. People like to entertain themselves, going to the movies, watching television, doing this and this and this and this. I remember talking to a leader at a very famous Bible school in the Midwest a few years ago, and he was laughing. He said, you know, we still have in our code of conduct for students that you can't go to the movies, that it's a sin to go to the movies. So, so what do our students do? They rent DVDs, you know, and they get around that. And that's how you get around that legal or requirement. Well, the fact is, there's nothing that says that going to the movies is a sin or watching a DVD is a sin. In many ways, these are kind of like these lifeless idols. They don't have any power in and of themselves. But this freedom can suddenly, if we're not careful, be something that Satan uses to lead us away from God. I couldn't believe this when I read this. You realize it's been 30 years since the attempted assassination on President Reagan, March 31st, 1981. I cannot believe it has been 30 years since that happened. You remember John Hinckley tried to kill the President of the United States. What motivated him to do that? A movie he watched. Taxi Driver. Watched the movie Taxi Driver. After watching that movie, he got the idea that this would be something maybe I could use to get the attention of Jodie Foster. You know, people who say, oh, what I watch, I'm free to watch anything I want to. What I watch has no effect on me whatsoever. Anytime somebody says that, I said, if that's true, why do you think advertisers spend billions of dollars on television commercials and radio commercials if what you see doesn't eventually cause you to act in a certain way? The fact is, entertainment can be something that Satan uses to lure us away from God. I was reading this week about a new field of science. Many of you may be aware of it, but I wasn't until I read about it called neuroplasticity. Are you aware of neuroplasticity? It's a new field of study that is proving that certain stimuli that come to our brain not only affect us psychologically, they actually change the physiology of our brain. They're finding that when you watch certain things, that new channels of neurocircuitry are being formed into your brains by what you watch. Dr. Norman Doyage is a leader in this field of neuroplasticity. He presented his findings to a symposium at Princeton University. And what he found was that watching pornography actually stimulated sexual interest in the one who was exposed to it, but the exposure diminished their own sexual interest in their partner. And what he also observed was this phenomenon that is usually associated with narcotics. Now get this. The effects to pornography produced in time sensations that began to tail off which then triggered the pursuit of new and more access to material in order to obtain the same stimulation. The brain wasn't merely receiving stimuli, it was actually being rewired to prompt new responses. Now think about that. Just like taking drugs causes your brain to be rewired to search for new and more satisfying stimuli, the same thing happens by watching pornography. It actually changes the makeup of your brain. He said the brain wasn't merely receiving stimuli, it was being rewired, and perhaps most paradoxical is how pornography can actually increase the desire for exposure to it without a corresponding increase in the enjoyment of it. See how Satan can use something as inanimate as a DVD, a movie, or something else to lure us away from the true God. One other example of freedom in Christ. There's a dollar bill. Is there anything sinful about this dollar bill? No, it's just a piece of paper with ink on it. It's amoral. It can be used for great good. Many of you invest your money every week in God's work, these dollar bills, in order to see God's work continue. But this dollar bill, if not guarded against, can also become an idol in our life that leads us away from the true God. I read a money magazine not long ago about a company that tries to motivate its workers by doing this. It tells its workers, now, on your refrigerator, 
Tape a picture of a new lake house or a new car or a new vacation spot that you would like to experience. And every day, just meditate on that picture. And if you'll meditate on it long enough, it will give you the motivation you need to work harder. Folks, that's nothing but idolatry. That's allowing something other than God to captivate our thoughts. I came across a verse this week I don't think I've ever seen before in Job chapter 31 about how money can quickly become an idol if we're not careful. Job 31 verses 24 to 28. If I have put my confidence in gold and called fine gold my trust, if I have gloated because my wealth was great and because my hand has, had secured so much... If I have looked at the sun when it shone or the moon going in splendor and my heart became secretly enticed and my hand threw a kiss from my mouth, that too would have been an iniquity calling for judgment for I would have denied the God above. Think about that. He says, if I put my confidence in money, if I have gloated about the pile of money that I've accumulated, that is an iniquity calling for God's judgment for that is the same as denying God himself. What do all three of these things have in common? Recreation, entertainment, money. They are all freedoms we have in Christ. But freedoms, if we're not careful, can become idols in our life that wrap their tentacles around us and choke out our love for God. Paul's message to all of us is to celebrate your freedom in Christ. But use that freedom to run from sin, not pursue sin. Use your freedom in Christ instead to pursue righteousness. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. Now, tomorrow on Pathway to Victory, we're going to take the truths we've learned today from 1 Corinthians 10 to be very, very practical. We're going to talk about three filters we should all use to determine whether or not we should engage in certain behavior that the Bible doesn't specifically prohibit. How do I know whether I should consume alcohol? What about participating in certain kinds of entertainment that some people find objectionable? How do I know how to make decisions that will honor God? We'll talk about that tomorrow on Pathway to Victory, as well as sharing with you five questions to ask before you make any decision in life. And that's tomorrow on Pathway to Victory. Now this month, for your generous gift to Pathway to Victory,